Hey, hi, hello, <laughs> hey, hi. Uh, here we have Felix, right? Another guy from Google today, I guess. Um, so welcome to Belgrade. Um, tell me, where do you live? <laughs> oh, this is already working. Is no? Yeah. Yeah? All right. I should be on stage? Yeah, yeah. Is please. it already starting? Yeah, Nobody yeah. told me. Ah. I thought I have five more minutes to relax. Okay. Oh, man. Uh, well, right now I'm in New York City, but I don't have a permanent place. I move to like different neighborhoods and different Airbnbs every month or so. Okay. Uh, because New York has so many nice areas to live in, so I figured, well, I want, I want to see all of them. So okay. I feel like you only get a real sense of how a city or a neighborhood is like if you stay there for a while, because so, just visiting is very different, right? So basically you take all your stuff with you? Yes, right? that's and right. And just move to another part. I live right? out of like one suitcase and one carry-on, and I actually have that with me now, meaning right now my home is Belgrade, which okay, is Okay, that's awesome. <laughs> um, don't break into my hotel room, because that's all my stuff in there. Um, so, yeah, it's been fun. Cool, cool. Let's, okay, thank you. Thank you for coming, and we're going to enjoy, enjoy your talk. Thank you. Thanks. All right, welcome everybody. Before I start with my talk, I need to get a sense of what the audience is like. Could you raise your hand? Who of you is a mobile app developer here? About half the room, maybe. And raise your hand. Who of you is an iOS app developer? About the same number, almost. All right, that's good to know. Um, so this talk is going to be iOS heavy. Many of the things I talk about can be applied to all mobile teams, uh, iOS and Android. Um, but again, it's mostly iOS because that's uh, my background. Over the past 10 years, iOS app development has changed a lot. We went from supporting just a single device, the iPhone, to supporting a wide range of iOS-powered devices, including Apple TV and so on. We went from manually including Git submodules or downloading source code from random websites to using proper dependency managers. We used to have two weeks long review times and suddenly it's, it's just less than a day. We used to only upload five screenshots to the App Store Connect page for the App Store marketing page. And now we have to upload five screenshots for each of the devices for each of the languages, resulting in over 110 languages per device. And then we went from, you know, full releases, like big releases, to A-B testing, slow rollouts, and even automatic regression detection. And a lot of other things, like we used to only have Objective-C and C++, and now we include JavaScript in our apps. And we used to use iTunes to install apps on our device and now we have all these powerful tools like test flight, enterprise distribution certificates, <clears throat> and third party beta testing services. And also, iOS apps used to run mostly locally, and suddenly we make heavy use of cloud services as part of it. Previously, we also mostly did releases whenever we felt ready. And suddenly, we ship more frequently. We might even have release trains. So, what is this talk even about? Well, raise your hand. Who of you has heard of 12-factor app? It's a good number, maybe a fourth. So we actually have a talk about 12-factor app here as on the schedule. Uh, Emily will give one in the blue room uh, later today about 12-factor. 12-factor was started by Heroku, by some of the Heroku developers, to define best practices for software-as-a-service applications. So that's backend application. And it is often referred by backend developers when designing the software architecture of their projects. So over the last few months, I've worked on applying the same principles or similar principles to the mobile app development processes. And if you look at what the developer community, especially the iOS developer community, blogs about, it's mostly about actual code, like how to solve certain problems, not so much about like software development processes applied to iOS. So everything I talk about in this talk is not specific to a specific programming language, but it can be applied to all mobile apps, no matter if it's Swift, Objective-C, Java, or JavaScript. All right, so let's get started. As you probably know, ideally, your build tools should never rely on the implicit existence of system-wide packages. All your dependencies 
should be declared as part of your project, as part of your Git repo. This includes the exact version of Xcode, CocoaPods, and Fastlane. This will allow you to re-trigger builds from, let's say, half a year or one year ago, and you know it will succeed as the build is fully reproducible. But that's, of course, just the ideal state. So front-end and back-end developers are much more advanced when it comes to this. They make use of a few principles that we as mobile developers are still lacking behind. In particular, one thing that's really exciting are disposable containers. Whenever a developer or a CI system wants to run a test or run a deployment, it would generate a new container that's completely empty and then use that to run the tests or run the deployment. Once that is completed, the container will be destroyed and not used again. So, unfortunately, we cannot use the same systems for iOS, just because we as iOS developers need macOS, and macOS cannot be run by Docker yet. So, this is a limitation thanks to Xcode, really. So, since we cannot use the same principles, how can we come close to it? Well, the first thing is, again, be explicit about your dependencies. Make use of a pod file for all your SDKs. Make use of a gem file to specify the exact version of your CocoaBots and of your Fastlane installation. And if you have any JavaScript dependencies, make sure to add the package.json to your Git repo. Automate the installation of Xcode. Please do not use the Mac App Store to install Xcode. This is far from ideal. Why? Well, because it doesn't allow you to specify the version. You will just get whatever latest version there is. And the main problem is the auto-update auto system of the Mac App Store will eventually mess up your setup. So you don't want to do that. So either you manually log into the Apple developer portal and install it from there and really choose a specific version, or you use a tool like Xcode install, which is open source, that allows you to install it automatically from the command line. So similarly to that, there is no standard way to specify what Xcode version to use. So for those people in the room who are not iOS developers will think, what kind of mess do we have here? Well, this is iOS development. Everything is in this one big binary being Xcode. So there is no way to specify the Xcode version, but some developers started making use of a .xcode version file. It's just a simple text-based file that basically just includes the version of Xcode that you're using. And some tools like Fastlane will pick up that file and use it to install that specific version of Xcode and use it from then on for the build. And finally, having all the dependencies in your repo obviously makes it much, much easier to onboard new developers, right? If you have a new developer, you probably know the pain of like setting up the tooling and installing the right version of each tool and then getting random compile errors just because there is some mismatch between the, between the versions. To the next topic, apps config. So an app config is basically everything that might change between deploys. This could be something in between test flight, app store, or local build, or anything that changes over time. For example, API keys for backend services, URLs you're accessing, or remote feature toggles. So of course, you should avoid having config values in your app source code. A good way to verify that this is the case for your application is to ask yourself, if I were to open source my app right now, would it cause any issues with security uh, to my application? Next up, API keys are a great example for configuration values. You do not want to keep API keys in the source code. Some API points might even require you to rotate keys, let's say every year. If that's the case, that would mean that your app would break after a year, and you will have to up, uh, submit a new version to the App Store. What it also means, if you change the deployment target, is that some people will not get this app update just because there is a version mismatch between the two. A-B tests have become more and more popular over the last few years. In the beginning, it was mostly used by Facebook and Twitter, but nowadays, everybody can make use of them. And there are a lot of SDKs available that do them for you. And finally, if you have a clear separation uh, for the configuration values, you can make use of over-the-air updates. And this is extremely powerful. It allows you to change any value remotely, over the air, instantly, without going through the App Store approval process. I can recommend setting this up for every value that you have in your application. So deployment. 
it goes without saying that ideally your deployment is 100% automated, right? There is no need to manually do things like updating the version number, dealing with code signing, uploading your binary, uploading screenshots. And almost all other software engineering fields have this figured out. And we as mobile developers are still lacking behind so much. Right now, the only tool that does it for iOS is Fastlane. But I'm sure over the next few years, there's going to be more innovation in the space because Apple just announced the App Store Connect API, which will allow us all to build better toolings for the Apple platform. So as mentioned before, in an ideal world, we would spawn up a new container and deploy from there. However, again, this is currently not possible. And so the best alternative that most iOS development teams use is having a centralized server that is only responsible for the deployment. It's the closest we can get to. And the cool thing is, if your deployment is 100% automated, is that you can then deploy from any macOS-based machine. So whenever macOS containers are a thing, you'll be able to use that. This also probably goes without saying, you do not want every iOS engineer of your team to have root access to your production Apple ID. You it's really, I've seen some really bad things. You don't want that to happen. So if every step of your deployment pipeline is fully automated, there is no need for an employee to have access to the production apps. And again, all the interactions with the Apple developer portal and App Store Connect should happen from the centralized server. And over the past four years, release trains became more of a thing. And this is something that server developers have been using for a while. The concept is simple. You want a release train leave on a fixed schedule, meaning that you ship a new release for a specific branch on a specific time. For example, ship every Friday afternoon, best time to ship. But don't forget, there is review time for iOS. So just to go over the basics of app versioning again, because that's something a lot of iOS developers mix up. We have two numbers that uniquely identify a build, the version number and the build number. The version number is called the marketing version. And this is the number that is visible to the end user. It's visible on the App Store and is part of the marketing material. And the build number is really just an incrementing number. Again, these two identify a build. And app versioning is a solved problem. Unless you work in a very, very small team, do not deal with them manually. Do not increment them manually, because mistakes are going to happen, and it's going to mess up everything. So, if you want to use Apple's provided tooling, you can make use of the HEV tool that allows you to increment the marketing version, the version number, as well as the build number. And if you use Fastlane, there are, of course, built-in actions that do that for you and make sure that version number gets passed on to the distribution step. So another question for the audience here. Raise your hand. Who of you, as a developer, had to generate the screenshots for the App Store page for the iOS apps? Just 10%. All right, lucky you. Uh, I spent much more time than I wanted on this. So just a little background on why this is necessary. If you finish building your iPhone app, you need to provide screenshots for the App Store page. And this might sound simple, but it's actually really hard to get right. Why? Well, one is just the sheer number of screenshots you have to generate. Because again, for every language, for every device type, you have to generate five screenshots. And then you probably want the same content and the same user interface elements to be visible on each of those, right? And then maybe you want to customize it for each, uh, each market. Like you might want to show different kind of screenshots in China just because you know that different features are used more often. And then on top of all, every time you change the design of your application or every time there's a new device, every time you add a new language, you have to generate those screenshots again if you have a social media-based app or any kind of app with dynamic content, you will need to fake the data. For example, if you have a list of all the recent files that were modified, you don't want them to show last modified two years ago. right? You want them to show last modified a few hours ago. So there's a lot of work that companies put into screenshots, and it is still being done manually very often. And it probably goes without saying at this conference, uh, we all developers here, we like to automate stuff. So Fastlane Snapshot is one of the tools that can solve that. The way it does it is it builds your app once and then runs it on all the simulators, all the screen sizes that you have to support. And the way it interacts in your application is it uses UI tests, which is provided by Apple. So UI tests, you basically provide uh, 
you tell UI tests how to navigate in your app and where to take the screenshots, and it will do it for you. So just like with containers, I always recommend using clean simulators that you generate each time you run a screenshot. Fasting Snapshot supports all the things you need to stop and fake all the data you want in your application. And then, of course, you also want to upload the screenshot. You can do that manually using dra drag and drop five at a time to App Store Connect. You can use the App Store, the iTunes Transporter tool, or you can also use Fastlane to upload it directly. One thing I especially love about Fastlane Snapshot is the accessibility support you get. Because Fastlane Snapshot uses UI tests, which uses accessibility, it forces you to add full accessibility support to your application. And that's something very often you know, people forget to add. So for example, if you want a screenshot of this specific view and you just cannot reach it with your accessibility options, that means you have to fix it. And it will make sure that every time you submit a new app store to the release, a new app to the app store, you that the accessibility labels still have to work properly. And one last benefit that companies really love about Fastlane Snapshot is the fact that uh, you get an overview of how your app looks across all the devices and across all the languages. So for example, if you support German and you have the cancel button, and in German that's abbrechen, which on the iPhone 5 takes up literally more than half the screen, your app is most likely to not look great on this specific screen. So again, those things are really hard to find, and Snapshot makes this a lot easier. And for the last topic for today is code signing. Code signing is the number one most hated topic across iOS developers. It's actually really difficult to get right. For code signing, you need the private key, you need a certificate, and you need a provisioning profile. And you have to keep all these three elements in sync. And you have to sync those across all the machines you want to deploy from. Apple does not provide a built-in way to sync private keys. So this is really, really difficult. You can build your own solution, but turns out building your own solution is actually tricky because you have all these edge cases of a certificate expires, and with that, all the attached provision profiles are also revoked. So Fastlane Match is a Fastlane feature that does that for you, uh, that uses Git to synchronize private keys in between machines, and it encrypts them using OpenSSL. And I've seen companies that explain to me why they cannot use Fastlane Match for security reasons. And when I asked them what they used instead, they're like, well, we don't really have a good solution right now, but we just send each other emails with the private key attached. And not only is this not secure, but also this will not scale. So please, please never do this and talk with your security team. <laughs> that was all. Thank you.